So everyone, welcome to Let's Talk with John Kane and half of Shawnee Rice. Half. I'm half present. <laughs> hey, it's great to be back. We weren't really off last week, but we uh, we we phoned in a show kind of we we recorded one and uh and i hope those of you who caught the show last week you really kind of got what i was trying to do i was trying to present a little bit of a different um narrative i guess or a different i don't know perspective on the whole mascot issue i mean it's wrong and and there's about 10 different ways to slice how wrong uh, native mascots are but but i wanted to present some information that perhaps you haven't seen before or heard before Obviously, I talked about uh, L. Frank Baum and, and his genocide editorials and how they're almost a prediction of this notion of ma of native masketry. Um, so there's that. And, and of course, you can't not talk about residential schools and some of what native kids were going through at the same time that little white kids were being encouraged to, to play dress up. Um, and and I guess the, the final part that, that I had to, you know, to, to contribute is all of those who say, well, native people don't aren't really against this thing. The thing that I tried to highlight most at the, in the second half of last week's show, in, in case you missed it, is that where I was involved specifically in, uh, in, a, in a fight in western New York, one of Buffalo's suburbs that was called the, the Redskins, um, and I was a part of a committee that was actually asked by the school board to come in and, and educate them about some of these issues. We did all those conversations. We, ha we, we had meetings and we, we had these, you know, larger community uh, engagement sessions. But one of the things that impacted it the most was when the native kids at three other school districts, you know, two Seneca territories, the Tonawana Senecas, the, the Seneca Nation, the Cattaraugus Senecas, and, and the Tuscaroras up in, um, uh, in the Niagara Wheatfield School District, uh, students from all, native kids from all three of those schools said, no, we're not going to compete against Lancaster. And, and one of those teams was the girls lacrosse team. Two of them were la well, boys lacrosse, one was girls lacrosse. And I said, no, we're not going to compete against a, a team that's calling themselves that. Because it's not just that they call themselves the R words. They actually kind of try to rub it in when they're playing against native students. And, and they're really kind of, um, they're, they're racist. I mean, these, these white kids, and, and Lancaster was 99% white. They would actually, you know, keep, you know, keep pressing this, this issue about, no, we're Redskins and, and we're going to, and, and it was, so anyway. Which the, is just reiterated from the adults. Like that's obviously so much opinion of the adults that it's trickling down to their kids because uh, kids are formulating their opinion. Absolutely. Their absolutely. Parents. And, you know, and of course it is institutionalized and, and encouraged at the institutional level when you have a school that calls themselves something like this. But so these, again, these native kids in these three other school districts, they, they were, they prepared to boycott. And so their teammates support them, their parents support them, the school support them, and three schools just said, no, we would rather forfeit, the, forfeit those games on our schedule than, uh, than go and, and, and compete and, and try to be sportsmen with a, with, a, with a school like this. So anybody who says, well, the native people don't really care about that, these were kids that were, they were unprovoked by the media, they were unprovoked by anything other than their own experiences. So to the extent that adults and people older, my generation and older, look, I'll admit, there is a certain level of native, um, of a view that native people had that, that they were enamored by the idea that, that some of the, the dominant society were, were, were propping up some native imagery. Before we, we, re we really saw it for what it was, mockery, um, there, and, and there are people my age who are, who are devoted Washington football fans and, and Cleveland baseball fans and Atlanta baseball fans regardless of the of the mascot issue although those numbers are, are waning and that's what i wanted to bring up last week and i hope you got that from the show um i, I really uh, i really felt like uh, you know, I, I i got that message across and i hope you got that and of course when we go to the phone lines and we're going to go to the phone lines early today because uh uh look we're off last week from phones we're, we're heading into fun drive next week uh we're not gonna have as much of an opportunity to, to take your calls for a while so i want to make sure we give uh, give a fair uh dose of it coming up now we are coming up on indigenous people's day so my our event tonight is is kind of a, a good way to to kick off a run up to that we're we're showing the film even the rain which is just a tremendous film it's a spanish language film so there are, there are english subtitles uh I'll, I'll put that caveat out there if you're you know one of those folks who have difficulty with that but it is really a great film and it you know the storyline involves making a film about uh, about christopher columbus and, and all the atrocities but the the filmmakers in the storyline are all 
also demonstrating their racism through, throughout the film. And of course, there's a battle over, over water, water is life. And, and it gets down to the point where it's expressed in the film that the, this multinational corporation that wants to control the water is even trying to control rainwater catchment. And that's where the name comes from, even the rain. Uh, great film, great character development. Uh, if you come out, you're really going to enjoy this film, uh, in, in spite of you know the, the subtitle issue. Uh, if we're going to we're going to show the it's at the Brooklyn Commons, 388 Atlantic Avenue, uh, downstairs from our WBI Studios. Uh, we're going to start the film at 7:30, but I want to encourage you to come early so we can do a little bit of the meet and greet, you know, socialize a little bit, and then stay afterwards and we'll have a conversation about the film i'm really hoping some some uh, uh spanish language speakers come out uh because they're they may catch some nuances that that those mm -hmm. of us you know scrambling to read subtitles might miss so um i've shown the film once before but it 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 absolutely warrants being uh, being not only screened again but uh but being seen again if you saw it once before come see it again especially if you were relying on subtitles because Watching it a couple of times, you, you do catch some of the stuff you might have missed. And they do some fantastic things with this film. And I look forward to having that conversation that's afterwards. That's a great film, yeah. So, again, that's tonight um, uh, at 7.30 at the Brooklyn Commons. Come early, stay late, and, uh, and we'll, we'll have some good conversations. All right. One other thing, a couple of things I just wanted to really j jam in here. On my show back home, and I do a show back home, which you can catch on my, my website, which is letstalknative.com. Um, you can catch my shows back home. Of course, we Facebook live stream those shows as well. Um, and, of course, they, this show and my shows back home go into a podcast. But my last show, I had to address some of this climate uh, climate wars issue. One of the things, and, and, and we haven't talked, so we're, we haven't talked about this and uh, prepped for this, but I had to come out, and it almost seems bizarre that I would have to do this, but I had to come out in defense of Greta Thunberg. Yeah, because not only did the, the, the right wing attack this 16-year-old girl who's been doing – who's been a bit of a climate activist for you know since well i've heard of her since she was 12 years old right. so she's been at this for a while she, right yeah and she's you know and she really has she really has honed the message well and she's captured a lot of attention and and she almost single-handedly um is responsible for the school walkout last week and, and, the, and the whole bit but the right really attacked her but here's the here's the part that's kind of uncomfortable it wasn't just the right that attacked her activists attacked her and and native people, some native people attacked her. And why? They said, "Well, why is the white girl getting all the attention?" I mean, so it it almost made my head explode a little bit when I started hearing people say, "Yeah, you know, well, there's native activists been at this for a lot, lot longer time, and you know, and and of course, then some of our people jumped into the whole conspiracy theory stuff. Wow, she, you know, she's George Soros's puppet, and you know, she's she's making a bunch of money, and 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 all this other stuff. And and now, so here's the thing." If you're an, if you're a native person and an activist, um, you do, and if you're if you're doing it to become famous, then you're not really an activist. You're you're a, you're a celebrity wannabe, and and I'm gonna just let out say it. I have no ill will towards Greta Thunberg, even though I understand the concern that that native voices have been uh, have been ignored. In, in much of this the, this climate debate, I mean, and look, we've got not only Greta Thunberg, but we got Autumn uh, Peltier, uh, who from Wekwemakong, and you know she's carrying on her grandmother's tradition. So, uh, and she's you know she's only like twelve or thirteen years old, maybe even fourteen years old, I guess. And you know, so no, we have native voices that that are quite capable of communicating some of the same message that Greta uh, Thunberg is, uh, has been communicating. And if we're not getting the attention, it's not Greta's fault. That's my whole point. Let's not beat up on her because you know she's managed to, to to capture headlines. I mean, we should we should support her message, and her message is the same as our message. And and anybody who's begrudging her because because she's white and from Sweden, I, I I'm I'm sorry. I'm I'm not going to jump on that. So I, I had to talk, discuss that on my last show. I want to throw that out here today because I, you know, look. I, you know, I got some response from some of my WBA listeners on my show from back home. And, you know, we'll, uh, when we open up the phone lines, I, I look forward to, to engaging some, uh, some of you on this issue. So uh, my two great friends were Greta's security detail of the whole march. And um, I, I think it's ridiculous to, for anybody to shame Greta herself because, the, like, we're all doing the same here. So if we're, if we're getting really, like – you're worth speaking and you're not, then we're just fragmenting ourselves. Mm -hmm. But the thing is also, 
there are a lot of indigenous youth and women of color. And the thing is, they've also been doing it for a while. So if you don't know about it, perhaps you need to search for it. Well, and by all means, like condemn, the, the, condemn the media if you want to. I mean, and especially the white dominated media. You can do that. Right. But it's also uh, Greta is in mainstream media because she's a young white girl, which is set up from mainstream media trying to profit. The thing is, like there, there's no short of young women of color, young people of color, young people doing the exact same thing Greta is doing. But the difference is, I know that because you know I've done activist work for a minute, so I know. What organizations can I find out who will have a young person of color in this position too? Yeah. Like Greta's easy to to make money off of because if Greta's speaking and you know you're going to go to their whatever news is covering it, but there's so many young people out there that are doing the same thing. Not Greta's fault again, but yeah. I I've heard a little bit of like some whitewashing of the this green movement from I don't know about if it's from Greta or her family, but. Yeah, I agree with that sentiment, 100%. Yeah. All right, and the only other thing I got to do before, and we're going to go right to the phone uh, lines, and those no, that number is 212 209 2877. That's the number to call to be a part of the show. Uh, one other thing I got to address. All right, I'm not going to talk a lot about the, the Trump impeachment stuff. You can get that on every other show on the mainstream media, so I'm not, I'm not going to go there. But I couldn't help but see across Facebook several posts that were highlighting. Um, Deborah Hallen and Sharice Davids, um, them weighing in on the on the impeachment, and and it's all across these native websites. And look, without trying to come out, you know, I'm not against these women, but in their statements, they never once mention, you know, their native background, their you know native culture or or anything else. There's nothing in their statements, either one of them, that connects them certainly to me, but to any Native people. They talk about Kansans and New Mexicans. And to be clear, Kansas is 85% white. 85% white. The Native population in Kansas is less than 1%. It's about two-thirds of 1%. 0.66% of the Kansas population is Native. Even in Sharice David's own own district, um, you know, Native population is only about 0.7%. Um, so... Look, she represents Kansas. You know, she isn't the the native representative. And same with uh, with Deborah Hallen. Uh, you know, New Mexico, three quarters of the state are white. It's seventy five percent percent white. Her district is only about fifty percent white, but about forty percent Asian. You know, native people are are only you know a couple of percents in in uh, in her district too. So, I, I, again. <sighs> I'm not bashing these women any more than any other Democrats, but that's what they are. They're just Democrats representing states that are, you know, their constituencies are predominantly white. They aren't in large native population centers. They aren't. And, you know, so sometimes I, I think we're getting sucked into the to the national politics. All this impeachment stuff. Look, I'm, I'm with guys like uh, Michael Harriet from The Root who says, uh, you know, it's it's uh, somewhat uh, you know it's it's kind of cute that the uh, that a, a mediocre white supremacist is uh, is disrupting the United States in such a way and, and, and destroying the country as as he put it. I mean, I'm not chant chanting death to America. I'm not saying that. But as a native person, seeing some of the chickens come home to roost here on the United States, a state a country built on racism and slavery and genocide. And seeing some of that white nationalism and, and, and some of this dirty politics that, that's always been there. I mean, look, there's been a misrepresentation about what the great experiment was the whole time. It was white aristocracy. They might have been, you know, um, aristocrats from the colonies, but it was still white aristocracy from the whole start. So let's not pretend that this was all about equality or equity or freedom and pursuit of happiness. It was pursuit of happiness for a very few. And though there's, those very few are still doing very well. Who, uh, what were people saying online about the Native women in their, what they were saying about no, this? Nothing really. They just, they just, you know, they put together a post saying, you know, again, specifically across Indian country today, all these, all these Native websites, you know, all, mm -hmm. or group pages, uh, Hal and David's weigh in on the impeachment proceedings. And when you read the, the you know, the, the, the articles, it was no different than what any of the other Democrats were saying. There, there was no reference to them being the native women in Congress. And, and uh, you know, so I, I guess the embrace of, 
of their message from from a native perspective I, I, I just, I just don't see that strong a connection. And so I just, I just want to put out, and I wanted to put the numbers to it because you know, if you're here in New York city, you might think, you know, you may think that Deborah Hallen comes from this, this region that is just really populated by native people. No, she doesn't. And, and Sharice David, even less. So I just wanted to put this in perspective. They aren't representing the native, uh, um, voice. They're representing their constituencies in Kansas and in New Mexico, which are predominantly white. Now, I'm not suggesting that I'm representing the native voice either. I'm representing a native voice. But I'm not here as, you know, a, um, again. Uh, you don't have a campaign based yeah. on it? Yeah, yeah. But here's the other thing that's important, which, okay, it, whether they are a voice of native people or not, it's super important to see native women in these high positions of authority because it's just like we've had white men be leaders for so long and you know that that's so problematic for young people young boys of color young girls of color i just don't want people to, to interpret their presence in in congress any more than the two white guys uh or i'm sorry the two native guys who are um native men who are in congress too the two from oklahoma that mm -hmm. are native they don't represent me any more than, than these women do. And, and so I, I just don't want to be rep being out I, there cast as, oh, yeah, see, Native people are represented in Congress. No, we're not. New Mexico and, and yeah. you know, uh, the first district of New Mexico and whatever the district is uh, of uh, Kansas that Sharice David. That's, I just got to put that out there. I don't, you know, it, it's kind of like, who is this that said uh, black people don't need reparations because they got Obama as the president for eight? It wasn't McConnell, was it? That was McConnell. McConnell yeah. I don't want somebody saying, oh, Native people don't need anything. They got they got uh, those two women there elected. <laughs> no, let's not let's not try that. So anyway, yeah. I, I just want to put that out there. I don't disagree with any other statement, by the way, but they made it very clear that they were there representing New Mexicans and Kansans. They never made any reference to um, this being particularly appalling to them, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, Trump's behavior because of their native upbringing, nothing like that. They didn't make any, and, and, and I don't know if that would have been appropriate, would have been appropriate either, but I'm just saying there was nothing in their message that would have distinguished them from any other Democrat male or female in uh, in congress I, I just just putting it out there all right so let me go let me uh, throw the phone number out there and we're going to try to get uh, more calls in than we normally do here because uh, again we're we may not be doing this you know for a few weeks here so uh 212 that's the number to call to be a part of the show oh. and uh i'll look forward to mixing up on anything you want to talk about even if you're going to drag me into the trump hole we'll uh, we'll try that too all right. Uh, what, what do we got here? Uh, caller, you're up first. Uh, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Yeah, my name is Tim. I live in West Milford. I'm actually calling from Traffic Tim right now. Um, Hi, Tim. And uh, I'm an old white guy, and I just want to say that I agree with everything I've heard so far in the show. I love your show. And I was at the Climate March uh, on Friday, and, and uh, the week before I was at the uh, Ramapo Lenape uh, Pow Wow up awesome. in uh, Ringwood, which was awesome. And, um, yeah, it's one of the things I liked besides not only was it youth running that particular show on, on Friday, but, you know, they had this uh, native woman from Brazil there who was so articulate, so good. And, and it's just excellent to see that this is providing a way for these voices to get out to the larger public. And I think that's so very important for all the reasons that you cite. And I'm going to get off because I want to let other people call in. But I appreciate the show. I appreciate your point of view and the way that you really parse things out and try to be very precise and exact about what's going on. Well, thanks, Tim. I appreciate that. And, you know, and again, I know sometimes when I voice some of the issues and, and voice my opinions here, they aren't necessarily the opinions that are that widely held even in, in Native territories, because I think that we, we have to be critical, not just of people we, uh, you know, that we may not necessarily be aligned with, but even the ones we are aligned with. We have to hold them accountable, too. So that's, that's yeah, my thoughts. Yeah, no, absolutely. But, um, again, this is... I, I think it's important to to not get sucked into into you know so much rhetoric, especially with the online stuff. I mean, I, I saw, I mean, I had to Snopes a few articles that said that she was earning forty six million dollars a year being an activist, and you know, and and all that was. Crap. I mean, I mean, I, also like activists do make money. Activists should make money. First of all, I don't think that they need to be. Well, I mean, whatever. If they're wealthy, they're wealthy, but. 
there's a lot of work that goes into being an activist and to do it all for free is un unrealistic. It's a lot of unpaid work, unpaid labor, stuff that goes on behind closed doors. Like I don't care if activists get paid for it. You can, t they're, if they're doing it for money or for fame, that's pretty clear. It's not like it's, you can't see through that anyway. Yeah, exactly. All right, let me go to another caller. Caller, uh, you're up next. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Tom from the Bronx here. How are you? Hey, Tom, how you doing? Yeah, I, I like to say that President Firebug in Brazil yes. is really causing more problems. In other words, I think there's going to be some heck of a revolution there. It's, it's, it's coming to that in Brazil. And over here, when they can have the goal to put these pipelines in, from Canada to the United States and all, there's trouble brewing over here, too. There's going to be a lot of trouble. Yeah, I, I think some of those folks, you know, um, as the U.N. was addressing climate, some of these guys really, <laughs> they really fell on their faces, inclu including, and of course, especially Donald Trump. But, uh, no, Bolsonaro is just, he's just, he's just the worst. And, you know, I, I posted a meme up earlier this week. I said, you know, you don't have to be white to be a nationalist. You don't have to be a white supremacist to be a nationalist. But it helps. <laughs> you look at most of these countries. There's there's a level of white supremacy that is behind their um, their their climate change denier uh, de denying their uh, their nationalism, their uh, anti-immigrant, anti-asylum, anti-refugee stance. I mean, there's there's so much of that that that's tied in. Um, it was you know I think there was a lot that was revealing and beyond all of the you know the the Trump Ukraine stuff I mean there was a lot that was revealed this week unfortunately it's easy to to miss some of the stuff because these other things grab all the headlines um, yeah so I, when I went to Brazil last year the day I left was the night that Bolsonaro got voted in which was the worst feeling ever because I was staying in Salvador, which is a, a black Brazilians and the guy I was staying with, his mom is uh, a, a well-known activist. And as soon as Bolsonaro got voted in, she didn't speak and I was leaving and we didn't get to have like a exchange because she was just so like upset Distra and broken. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, my friend from Brazil just sent me an article yesterday about the police shot an eight year old girl. There's like, I mean, which is you know, not super surprising, but um, Angela Davis has been pretty open about going to Brazil and Bahia, especially, and really highlighting the work that the black women are doing there and that we need to look to the black women in Bahia and Salvador for the work that they're doing to bring back here in the way that they're organizing. Yeah, and, and I got to say something for those people who think that um, white supremacy and white privilege will end simply because, you know, by 2030, the, uh, you know, white people will finally not be the, the majority. They will fall below 50 percent of the U.S. population. I got to remind people, there are places all over the world where a white minority has uh, been very oppressive towards, uh, you know, towards people of color. Brazil is a perfect example of that. I mean, the the yeah. white folks, uh, Bolsonaro as a, as a white man does not represent anything near um, a majority in, in Brazil. In fact, the majority of Brazilians are not, I mean, if you look at the breakdown of their parliament, it does, it's not reflective of, of the racial diversity at all. I mean, that's pretty clear across many countries is that their leadership and their government will be like more light skinned than the people. The itself. Venezuela, the, the Venezuela battle. It's, I mean, they want to say this is socialism against capitalism, but it, no, it's white versus brown. I mean, let's not let's not pretend it's anything other than that. I mean, you know, Guaido represents the the white folks, and Maduro is representing the brown folks. I mean, that's just the way it is. All right, let me go to we'll go to one more call before we take a break here. Uh, caller, you up next. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hello. Yep, you're up. Hey, John. My name is Ian. I'm calling from the Bronx. Hey, Ian. Uh, uh, good to hear from you. Yeah, I met you uh, a few years ago down at the um, uh, the museum of the um, Native American. When, oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. When Char Charlie Lowry was down there with her band. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, even have some, I even have some videos and photographs from that occasion. Oh, that great. Maybe I'd like to share with you. Oh, that would be that'd be great. I, I I got some too, but yeah, I'd love to get get some of those. Maybe you can. Do you do Facebook at all? Um, I used to, but I, I can get back on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hook up with me on Facebook. I'd love to see some of the photos, and we'll we'll post them up. Yeah. One other 
uh, calling about was to thank you for uh, actually uh, educating me about the um, the whole mascot issue. Mm-hmm. You see, I, I came here like um, from the Caribbean about 34 years ago, mm-hmm. and I got so hooked into the the whole uh, mascot issue, especially with like Florida State, mm-hmm. with uh, which features uh, Chief Osceola riding out riding out. Uh, on a white horse and then tossing a um, a burning spear onto the ground. I got yeah. so caught up. I got so caught up in that imagery, you know, that yeah. I didn't realize all the time that I was, you know, being um, duped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, the, uh, the Seminoles were not exactly a horse culture. It's pretty much <laughs> a, a swamp area. Yeah, they, they they're more connected to alligators than to, than, to, than than the horses. So the whole thing is just yeah, you were duped. I mean, you were being propagandized badly, and that's that's kind of what this does, right? Yeah, yeah. And the whole tomahawk chop thing with the, the Kansas City Chiefs. You know, I, being a sports fan, I got kind of caught up and didn't realize that um, you know they were really. Um, you know, maligning the the image of Native Americans. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, well, which we've talked about before plenty of times on this show, um, but you can tell because when rivals are playing any mascot that is indigenous-based, you see how racist it gets so quickly because competition makes everything violent and gross and fierce, like all, shows all the true colors of what America is, and you can see the, how the other team will be creative in the way that they show their spirit for their team like the trail of tears or they'll put an, an indian head with the headdress on in a pallet with a sword, a sword or or, a staff, or something yeah, all kinds of and stuff and then yeah. that sports team will put them behind like the sports the backdrop and be like look at how creative our fans are well and, even, like, even the commentators when you when you when you right, see well, when you see a a headline that says you know such and such were massacred you know or you know or whatever i mean or you know, or they'll use some sort of, you know, trite, you know, oh, the the Cowboys really scalped the uh, the Redskins or something. I yeah. mean, it's just, you know, that's just the stuff that just just gets so old. But uh, yeah, yeah. I also I also come from a culture in which, um, you know, they have something um, around uh, February each year in which uh, people, you know, kind of take pride in dressing up like Plains Indians. How Wait, do you feel about that? In Halloween? Yeah, no, she's saying in February. No, uh, you know, all of that stuff. I mean, it's like, like, like it, a Mardi Gras, like how, like how the, the people in New Orleans do like sometimes a Mardi Gras. Well, and, and look, there, there are, uh, you know, a black Indian thing that goes on in Mardi Gras. And that doesn't bother me. But the, but the whole idea of people who have no connection to Native people, especially, I mean, look, if it's wrong to, to be go blackface, you know, or brown face. I mean, Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada, is is been getting through a lot of heat, and yeah. and it is, and it is wrong. I mean, look, it's it's out, it's overt racism. But if you can acknowledge that black face and brown face are bad, then you have to acknowledge that red face is wrong, red and is not just red bad. face, but the headdress, the costumes, all of that. Look, also, it's not your culture, and you're making a mockery. It's of it. also because you, when you're put, when you're doing this, you're probably grabbing like a Western Plains headdress, which Pan doesn't Indian. align with. Yeah. The, that person's background and even if the person's like oh well my grandma was native or whatever like that doesn't matter because if your grandma was native and if she was connected to her community then she wouldn't let you out of the house wearing this piece on your head and if you were connected to your community you know that this probably is not the right place for you to wear a headdress right yeah right. okay one one last question what's your opinion on putting like uh, the head of a native american on coins you know, well, I, I, I don't, I, I don't think we belong on on U.S. money. I mean, the the whole thing. You know, I'm, I'm not exactly a fan of the U.S. capitalism, and I know they've done it in the past, and you know, and even when they did the, the, the the dollar with the Sacagawea dollar. I, look, they even put, they even had the Hyacinth belt on on one of those on, on a, a line of those those Sacagawea dollars, and they did it wrong. They it, most people don't notice it, but if if you ever see one of those coins. The the wampum belt has the ends of the wampum belt the um, that symbolize the, the the five nations. It it ends, 
in our wampa belts, those the 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 white part of the wampa belt continues right to the end of the belt, as if we could still add to it. It's not defined by an ending. So so even when they do this stuff, they they, they get it wrong. Okay. No, I I don't want to be. I I have no desire to see Native people. I do think I'd love to see uh, Harriet Tubman replace Andrew Jackson on the um, on the twenty. Though I think it's a cute <laughs> idea, but unless we're getting part of that coin, then it doesn't matter because if you're not paying reparations or if you're not even acknowledging the subject, then don't the, putting us on the money isn't going to what is that point what is that going to do yeah so and, not and, helping anybody. and to shawnee's point most of u.s policy and u.s economic policy has um almost intentionally created poverty for native people uh and and people of color but uh but uh, but for, probably is the worst poverty in the in the country and when i hear somebody talking about you know unemployment at 14 percent in in this region or that region you know i'm thinking Try 40%. Try 50% that exists on some native territory. So anyway, all right, hey, we're going we're gonna to go take a real short break here, go out with a little bit of a song, uh, and we'll come back to more of your calls. The, again, the number is 212-209-2877 to call to be a part of the show. We'll take your calls right after this. Can't you hear the babies cry? Can't you see the parents try Give a child a better life He works an honest day For his honest pay Still can't see you get ahead Your heart is cold Been hurt so many times before Don't turn your back on Precious love Cause there's somebody walking around Feeling just like you are now But they ain't gonna come through Your front door Open up All right, thanks for coming back. This is John Kane with Shawnee Rice. Uh, let's get us on the screen here. There we go. I always forget this. Shawnee reaches across every once in a while because I'll still have the banner up. And <laughs> so I appreciate that. At least somebody's paying attention. Um, hey, uh, we are going into Fun Drive starting next week. Um, and we, we will be on uh, for next week. But I do, as I do with every show, I want to remind people, you can call the pledge line anytime. You can call and, and become a, a WBAI buddy. And you can put the show down as uh, as the show that you're, you know, you're, you're, you're specifically want to attribute your your donation to so you can go to the pledge line it's 516-620-3602 and you do that anytime you go online you can go to www.give to wbai.org that's give g-i-v-e the number two wbai.org and and by all means you become a buddy and you can make a donation of any size you can do a one-time donation or you can you call the number as often as you you see fit you know you you hit some money at the track or whatever else the lottery uh, i don't know somebody pays you back money they've owed you forever hey. <laughs> whatever if, if you got some, some some cash that you want to um uh support something worthwhile and and i think what we're trying to do here is 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 try to enlighten people so um that's also you can write it off yeah you know. it is it's it is right. tax deductible and you know, and that has value for some. So, uh, um, and, and it is a good cause. We are providing voices that you're not going to hear anyplace else. And uh, this show in particular, you, trust me, there's not a whole lot of places you can hear a native perspective on any of these things. I, you know, I have conversations with people all the time. They say, geez, I never even thought about that. I never looked at it that way, which is kind of what we're doing with the, with the screening tonight with the, even the rain. So I, I encourage people to come down for that uh, 7.30 this evening uh, at, uh, at the Brooklyn Commons, 388 Atlantic Avenue. And uh, come early and we'll talk and stay late and we'll talk some more and uh, uh, look forward to that. Um, but again, I want to 
to remind people we, we are going into Fund Drive, and uh, well, we're trying to raise a few more dollars before we, we kick off the, the new fiscal year, which starts uh, in October 1st. So if we can uh, get a few more buddies lined up, we can you know trim away at the, at the, at the deficit we still have for this year. So, um, uh, again, uh, the, the, the number is uh, 516-620-3602. The web, the web page or the website is give to WBAI.org, and that's how you can uh, contribute to the show. You contribute to the station. You contribute to uh, uh, to what we're doing here. So, all right. Um, uh, let me go right back to the callers. Uh, we've we got a couple of topics that we've uh, we've had out there, so we'll, let's see what uh, what we've got. Caller, you're up next. What's your name and where are you calling from? Yes. <clears throat> yes, how you doing? <clears throat> I'm good. Big J, Big J from Harlem. How hey, you doing? Hey, Big J, thanks for calling in. All right. Yeah, I want to first thank you. Let me just preface with um, commending you and thank you. you. I've been listening to your show for a while. And um, it, 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 all the way back when you uh, first came on, and you placed um, Kelkerson for oh, a yeah, while. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and you, one thing you always do is come to the real WBI true progressive spirit. And that's just simply saying that you allow callers to call in and express themselves or their opinions and things, even when you disagree, even if you disagree with it, it's just like you just cut them off or nothing, and you, you and you'll expand on that or whatever, or at least just address it. So uh, that's that's like I said, in the real WBI true progressive spirit. So that's that's yeah, I appreciate that. Um, I wanted to um, have a question and a comment. The two, actually, there's two questions and a comment. The first thing is. Um, White supremacy, this is the American way, right? And then all throughout, right? Because it is in, in uh, England and, and, you know, mm-hmm. Spain and wherever they colonized. But there's, um, it, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was racist that the white had, I forgot this president, but I'm just keeping it sort of vague, had accepted only five nations or people. But you know, the Cherokee, Cherokee, and a few others. So and that they wanted to acknowledge. Okay, so that right there, if you just think about it, you cut all the other ones off. We're not going to accept them, and boom. And also amongst them, that means amongst us, there's called indigenous people, indigenous to this land. And that's what happened to this land. There were absolutely, factually speaking, black indigenous people. Now, not just saying African, like all blacks came from Africa. I'm just mm. uh, so over that. It's not true. We populated the earth, Brazil, here, the so-called American, other places. So I'm leading up to saying that when we speak, people speak of black and indigenous people, and as if all black people, one, came from Africa, and we only came here pretty much when they brought most over from the slave trade is, is that that's most, not all. But we were here and interacting and it also then before we were here, blacks from Africa did come and trade and come back and forth to trade with us. But I'm saying not just us as indigenous people. Mind you, let me say I am actually Cherokee. But in my family we've had this talk. We're from the North Carolina region. We got North Carolina, South Carolina, Lumberton and that so that's my pure bloodline, as I find out and learn more about. But we had came, and we're grown, and as our discussions, it progressed. I mean, it's evolved to not just say, oh, our in, so-called enemies, our Cherokee side, right? We don't like to wear any anymore. Or our black side. We're now saying our black indigenous side, the black Cherokee. In other words, you're saying, in other words, even the white supremacy amongst our Cherokees, not just particular, but let me say the indigenous, there were... Uh, there was discrimination because white had injected that in, and the darker ones were not accepted, but the lighter were. So, and in order to acclimate and be accepted and not be put into slavery and so forth and so on, we as a people, indigenous people, unfortunately, we started conforming to that. So let me bring it to a head, and I would really want you to answer. That's why I'm putting up into a question now. Just wanted to say that first so you see the foundation I'm giving that we, unfortunately, um, and then we had a part of in this enslaving, not only I need you to get to, I need you to get to it quickly because I want to have time to okay. respond. So go ahead. The doors rose were white people who took advantage of the um, what was given to us that was owed to indigenous people, and they were actually white people who then now, if you look at it legally, if they go back, sort of, they would be 
or, or wherever they are, they would represent themselves as indigenous people. But in actuality, they are not. They're not like an indigenous people. They're actually white people. So that's where the question comes in. Is one, the doors rolls. Are you familiar with that? Oh, yeah. Two, are you familiar with that? Actually, black indigenous people. All right, let, let, me, let me get to it because I want to I uh, uh, hit a few things. For one thing, um, there's no question that the federal government did more to, uh, to acknowledge the most assimilated Native people, especially the ones who converted to Christianity and that kind of stuff. And, that, and that's, it wasn't even just about light skin versus dark skin as much as it was just pure conformity and assimilation. And the five, what they call the five civilized tribes uh, of, uh, of Oklahoma, they weren't the only ones, but they were the, that's, you know, they, they dubbed them with that label because they felt like they had, uh, they had assimilated enough to be, uh, to earn that, that name. But, and there was no question that, the, that there was a, a lot of racism that, uh, that Native people experienced based on uh, how much they wanted to, to maintain their, their distinct uh, autonomy and how much they were willing to, to conform. So that, um, there, and I, I agree with you that, uh, you know, that, uh, African, uh, uh, people had made it across the Atlantic uh, on their own without having to be in the belly of a slave ship. Um, there's always this this big argument about uh, the single point origin uh, for indigenous people on this continent. And I don't buy any of the, the notion that there is a single point of origin. I think native people, you know, look, we've got our own creation stories and uh, we don't become obsessed with um, with how we got to this land. We, we consider ourselves to be um, indigenous to this land, period. And, you know, anybody who's trying to say we came across the Bering Strait or across, you know, from Polynesia or from Africa or whatever. Well, yeah, yes, probably, maybe uh, all of the above. But um, so so there's that. There's also a strong connection between Native people and uh, and Black people because of our our shared experience in the the colonial era. So there, there's there's no question about that. Um, there, I will say one of the things that happened. You mentioned North Carolina. In some of those Southern states. You couldn't even identify yourself as native. Um, the the state governments would would only list you as either black or white. Uh, so that was a way to, to kind of even strip more of the indigeneity away from people. Go ahead. Well, and I want to say, yeah, of course, people know that there's black and native people. Like, I mean, within the activist community, we know that. I mean. I don't know how much common folks know about it because common folks don't seem to know too much about natives in yeah. general, but like people who are native, of course know that there are black and native people. But I will say the caveat to that is that there is anti-blackness with the native community as if there's anti-blackness within any community. Yeah. And personally, I think whenever we jump on the bandwagon to say native lives matters, I mean, it's not anti-blackness, but it's certainly like we know Native Lives Matter and we know Black Lives Matter and, and we can't just piggyback off the Black Lives Matter movement. Like, we have to create our own. Not, we can't. Well, and I support the Black Lives Movement, but I don't need to water it down by saying, well, all lives matter. I mean, it's like... Or mis- Native Lives Matter. Like, you have to... We, yeah. you, we can't steal other people's campaigns yeah. and then say, like, we matter too. Then, okay, then make our own campaign. Like, yeah. we can't... I don't know do more. <laughs> there we go. Exactly. All right, on the Dawes Act stuff. The Dawes Act was about stealing land. I mean, the, the whole idea was... To um, uh, to allot the lands to uh, so native people would have specific deeds to a uh, to a segment of land. Oftentimes, doing it so there would be uh, so that there would be an excess of land that was not allotted that the federal government would just dole out to white people. And and of course, the reason to allot the land was so native people could be solicited individually to. Um, to sell off that title. The whole idea was to, to undermine the idea of us holding land in common and the idea that land would be native land. They tried to reduce it down to individual native land that could be uh, be gone after. So no, the Dawes, the whole allotment process, the Dawes Act was all geared towards trying to, to rob native people of lands. All right, we got time for one, maybe only a call or two. So let me try to get to another caller. Caller, you're up next. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hi, John Shawnee, Lonnie Harrington. How you doing? Hey, Lonnie, Hello. how you doing? Okay, I actually called up about one thing, but you went off in the Dawes and Five Civilized Tribes. Maybe you should do a whole show on that, and I'll call back about that. But my original point for calling, this whole thing about Greta Thunberg, I want to weigh in as an older guy. And with acknowledging there have been other people very active in terms of dealing with uh, what's been happening to the climate for decades, uh. I feel that any young person on this planet, regardless of their background, has a right to demand, not ask, demand that older folks really take some action and do some yeah. stuff because Booyah. and I'm being yeah. polite, they've been stonewalling. 
Yeah. So I've got no yeah. problem with Greta Thunberg happening to be getting attention. Any young person around here has a right to demand that. Yeah. I, mean, I, I, I absolutely now. agree. And, and let's, let's face it, the, the, the more we fail to act as far as you know, people before us and our generation, the more we're casting, the more we're mortgaging the future of our, uh, of our young people. So absolutely, they have a right to well, lash out. Well, you know, I'm looking, I'll probably be a grandfather soon, and I'm thinking about, you know, we think seven generations ahead. And I get angry when anyone threatens my family. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, yeah, my kids and my grandkids are really going to get the brunt of this. Mm -hmm. I mean, as an old Florida country guy, okay, um, my heart goes out to any hurricane victims. I know what hurricanes can do. What happened to the Bahamas, mm -hmm. I can't even imagine, man. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. I've been through hurricanes, but to have a Category 5 sitting on you for, what, 61 hours? I <laughs> I can't imagine that, man. And this is only the beginning. Well, and, and, and that folks, Native people, indigenous people are going to bear the initial brunt of all climate change. I'm not saying that everybody's not going to be affected at some level, but there's no question that indigenous people are going to bear the brunt of uh, the, the initial cat catastrophes caused by, and, and we're, already, we're already seeing it. Yeah, around the planet. Yeah, yeah. Definitely absolutely. around the planet. Oh, let me just say one thing in closing real quick since I didn't bring up the hurricane. I will say this. My relatives of the Seminole tribe of Florida, on our own, we started delivering water soon after the uh, storm left. So I'm very proud of the relatives down there. I mean, yep. And again, my heart goes out to any victims of this storm because I know what those storms can do. Right. Well, thanks for the call, Lonnie. I appreciate it. Um, hey, um, you mentioned being a grandfather. I've got I to gotta say, my, my grandson, my oldest grandson, my first grandson, I've got nine. So my first grandson turned 16 years old. So uh, it kind of, you know, as a, you know, a relatively... I still think I'm a young grandfather, but you know, I can, you know, I, I, I can't really beat him in basketball anymore. But, uh, <laughs> but my my grandson turned 16, so I want to wish Gavin Jimerson a uh, happy 16th Aww, birthday. So. Happy 16th birthday! <laughs> and, and and I brought him. You know, Gavin's here. I, uh, Reggie, you haven't had a chance to meet uh, meet my grandson. No, I haven't. But uh, Michael G has, and uh, he's been in awesome. the studio, and we we played ball down here. Uh, he wanted to play basketball in New York, and I said we play basketball all the time. He goes, yeah, but it's on my bucket list to play New York on the on the outdoor courts of New York. So we. We played in Brooklyn. We played in Hi. Manhattan. So I says, "Wait a minute! You were only twelve. You got a bucket list." Uh, anyway, <laughs> that's <laughs> we, good. We checked that one. We checked that one that's off. That's good. Hey, look! I want to thank everybody for for. Uh, we get all right. We got time for one more call. We'll we'll try, we'll try to do one more here. All right, Carl, you're up next. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hi, how are you? This is Bill, New York City. Hey, Bill. Hello. How you doing? Great show. Uh, just a quick, quick point and question. Uh, Malcolm X, you can Google this, used to invite neo-Nazis in full uniform to attend their rallies, the Nation of Islam. The Nazis were invited to speak on the stage. I'm not making this up. Google Malcolm X meets the Nazis. The reason I mention it is because if you look at Harlem today, it's the liberals taking over Harlem. It's liberals. And, and none of the liberal neighborhoods around Harlem, the white liberal neighborhoods, rent to blacks. My question is, why aren't blacks? Please, please Google what I said earlier. Why aren't blacks standing with signs saying, Dear liberals, please let us have Harlem. We are still not rented to in your white liberal neighborhoods. Malcolm X always said the white liberal is the bigger racist. That's in his book. And please Google what I said. Malcolm X meets the liberals. 10,000 Muslims at a black rally. Nazis in the front row. Nazis speaking on the stage. Nazis giving money to Malcolm X. And they got along uh, friendly. Because Malcolm X uh, said they shared a common vision. Harlem would still be black. The liberals practiced the worst form of racism because they took over Harlem. They're trying to rename Harlem Soha, as in Soho. And and had their message been listened to, Harlem would still be black today, people. Well, okay. I mean, uh, I, it, let, let me let me weigh in. Of, of course, you know, I'm not going to advocate for for you know white supremacy or Nazism or any other stuff, also, regardless of whatever. We can't talk about why black people aren't doing that. We're not black. Yeah. But what, here's what I will say: there there are no there's nobody pushing back about uh, against gentrification more than black people <laughs> and you know and while white people you know it's it, we can sit there and say no you're liberal i'm conservative you know to most of us of people of color you're white people i mean <laughs> and, and, also and i'm not saying you're all exactly the same but i mean let's face it we've been we've experienced racism from the left and from the right you know so when i say and, and again, this is one of my one of my memes that, you know, got people a little bit uh, riled up. I said, you know, racism isn't a right thing. It's a white thing. I mean, it, and and it is. I mean, by definition, it, it, it kind of is. But and, and while I'm not going to speak to, you know, as Shawnee said, to why, you know, black people aren't uh, aren't attacking liberals. Well, there could be a host of reasons for that. But, in but the they end also are. And this is my point. Why I get so annoyed, because it's like. I, 
everybody thinks that it's not happening, but you don't know where to look. Like I know so many youth people and people my age, I'm like 29, that people of color who are actively fighting in Harlem and actively like aggressively fighting in the Bronx too, anti-gentrification, like they are out there. So to say like, why aren't they not or that they're not is erasing the work that people are doing. You just got to know where to look for the work. Any environmentalist group, people of color in Harlem and the Bronx, which there are many, 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 they are doing the work. They're put there. I mean, I don't know if you use social media, but they're all over social media. I don't know if age is a factor, but like there are plenty of young people of color in Harlem and in the Bronx fighting anti-gentrification, holding workshops on what it means, like holding six month workshops on what gentrification is and what we can actually do about it. I mean, there's. Yeah. And, and when you and again, when you're saying liberal, you, you're to me, I'm just hearing white people because I know there are people who are considered progressive or liberal who are opposed to gentrification. And there are plenty of, you know, uh, there are segments of that population. So, I mean, the, the blanket label of liberal and liberalism. And, and you know, also you know, when we are picketing or and protesting gentrification the news doesn't cover that they yeah. don't care that happens every day so yeah. like maybe that's also why you're not hearing about it all right we gotta get out of here uh next show coming up uh driving forces after us uh so uh welcome those guys after we clear out of here i want to thank you guys for listening uh we will we'll be back next week as we kick off uh the, the fall fun drive and uh we'll we'll catch up with you then this is john king with johnny rice this is let's talk Yahweh.